Hey, it's Wednesday, May 19th, and Thursday, May 20th. And this is both regular and advanced because it's the same stories for both classes. Uh, let's see, today was the last day to buy candy. Uh, this is the birthday. We're actually going to come out with the birthday candy during one of the stories. Um, let's see, from there, I did take pictures of the kids who are here. And for those of you who are digital kids, we miss you. I'll try to Photoshop you in. Uh, if you have your book, you can still cash in your book once you have finished test. Uh, then you can still turn it in even through next week. That is fine with me, but not if you borrowed my book. If you have not finished test, you're more than welcome to work on test now. Again, it's not due till Sunday. So as long as you have it turned in by Sunday night, you're good to go. Monday morning, any test not turned in, get turned into a zero. Does that mean you can't turn it in? No, you can still turn it in. It just means I'm tired of waiting. So you can still turn it in all the way through that last Wednesday if you want. I'll still be more than happy to give you credit for it. It's just that at some point you do it. So if you want to work on it now, that's fine with me. If you have another class you want to work on, honestly, it's fine with me. If my story is not entertaining enough to keep your attention, that's on me. And so I have no problem with it as long as you're not distracting me. Then for you guys, here is where we jump into the actual story. Fingers crossed. I think we got started the classes with you guys. I'm really hoping things go well. The only drawback is, whew, it's really warm today. It's making it tough. So here's a. The reason why I tell stories at the end of the year, as opposed to doing other things. One, I didn't always used to do this. Most teachers show movies at the end of the school year. And there's a reason why teachers show movies at the end of the school year. Actually, there's a couple of reasons. One, y'all be insane. Uh, the fact of trying to deal with you at the end of the year is exhausting. And yeah, I know a lot of you guys are done with school. A lot of teachers are done with you. And I mean that in the nicest way. And by putting a flickering screen up there, it really helps calm you guys down and makes our lives a lot easier. The other reason is we also have homework that we don't want to do. We are given stuff from our bosses, paperwork that we have to fill out at the end of the year that we don't want to do any more than you guys want to do your homework. So a lot of times if we let you guys watch movies, we can sit there and get work done. And that's what I did for years. And it was a happy time. But things changed. So a couple of years into my teaching, like two or three years, um, I was sitting at my desk after school one day and knock on my door. And it was an eighth grader who I had the year before who like leaned in and was like, hey, Mr. Brody, that's how you doing? I'm like, hey, random kid who I no longer teach. He's like, can I come in? I'm like, why? I'm like, to talk. I go, to who? I'm like, to you. I was like, okay. As a kid, I didn't have a teacher that I would go, you know, there were no teachers that kids would go talk to. Like there was not teachers when I was growing up that kids would choose to talk to, that you would spend like a passing period going and talking to, or that you would send messages to, or that you would choose to spend time around for any reason. So the idea of this eighth grader coming in to come talk to me threw me off because I never experienced that as a kid growing up myself, but it was fun. The kid came in and we talked about life and we talked about like home life and friends and what was going on in the world, stuff like that. And the kid was smart and it was a fun conversation, but one that I'd never had before and one that I'd never had as a student with a teacher before. So the next day in class, I did a timeout like halfway. There's like timeout. He's like, what? I'm like, all right, this really weird thing happened yesterday. Like, what? I'm like, so I'm sitting at my desk and this kid comes in. I told him the story about this eighth grader. And I'm like, is that weird? And they're like, yeah, that's weird. I'm like, do you guys go and talk to your teachers? Like, no, we don't talk to teachers. I'm like, all right. That's like a weird, like, that's a weird thing. I'm like, okay, good. I'm like, so it's not just me. I'm like, no. And before I can move on, when the kid raised his hand, he's like, uh, Mr. Brody, I'm like, yeah. He goes, can anyone do that? I go, can anyone do what? He goes, come in and talk to you. I'm like, do you want to? He's like, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe come talk to you. I'm like, I'm not going to turn a kid away if you want to come talk to me. That's fine with me. He's like, oh, okay. And I didn't think much more about it. But it became a more frequent thing where after that day, I had different eighth graders and more eighth graders who would just come by and talk. And I liked it. It was an enjoyable thing getting to talk to kids where it wasn't in a classroom setting, where I got to find out more about who they were. And it made me a better teacher because I learned more about how kids work and interact with the world. And it continued on that way for a couple of years. So one day, sitting at my desk, knock on the door, and I look up, and it's not an eighth grader. It was a high school kid that I had not seen in years. Uh, he was like a junior in high school. So it's been like three or four years since I even seen this kid. 
and knock on the door. I'm like, hey. He's like, can I come in? I'm like, why? He's like, to talk. I'm like, you don't go to school here. He was like, I know. I was like driving by. He's like, I got my license a couple months ago and I saw your car. Uh, every kid used to know my car because on my wall was still over here. I used to have my car. Uh, I had to cut it out just because I'm running out of room of things to put on my walls. But kids knew I had this big purple Pontiac. I used to see it all the time. So the kids knew what car I drove. So he saw my car and deliberately stopped at the school to come in and talk. I was like, are you here for a reason? He's like, yeah, to, to come talk to you. And I was like, well, that's weird, but sure. And so I talked to this high school kid. And it was weird, but I enjoyed it also of talking to this past student. So that continued for a couple of years of like random high school kids showing up and talking. And I enjoyed it. And I thought that was as far as it would go until Clayton came by. So Clayton was a kid I had in my fifth period. And Clayton was a high maintenance, very active, nonstop energy child. But I loved his energy because he was this really short kid. And so he did all of his shopping, or I did a lot of his shopping at Goodwill. And he would go into Goodwill in the little kids section and buy like little kid furby shirts. And then he would wear them to school. And if anyone made fun of him, he would just laugh at it. He was like, I don't care. He was like, I love this shirt. He was like, it's got like little pinks and purples. It's got like a little puppy on it. And you couldn't make fun of him because he simply did not care. And I loved his energy. He drove me nuts, gave the kid attentions, but I loved his energy. And so eighth grade, he was a wrestler. I was a wrestling coach. He and I interacted that way. Things went well. And then didn't think I'd ever see him again. Till this day, three years later, he shows up in my doorway. And I look up and Clayton looks wrecked. Something is going on. I look at him like, Clayton. I'm like, dude, it's been like three years. He's like, hey, can I come talk? And I'm like, you can come in and talk. So he comes in and shuts my door. And I'm like, oh, this is like a talk talk. And he comes in and sits down. I'm like, hey, Clayton, like, what's going on? He was like, I screwed up. I've done a bad thing. I'm like, oh, we're going to have one of those talks. And so I lean for him, like, okay. He's like, so my parents know about this and they're not talking to me right now. And I don't know who else to turn to. And you were always really nice to me in class. So I thought I'd come talk to you. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. He goes, well, so I started smoking pot like a year and a half ago. And I was like, oh, we're going to have this kind of talk. And so he goes on to tell me the fact that he'd been smoking pot for a year and a half. And it was helping him out, but you know, he like separated from his friends. And he was up in Noblesville the previous weekend at the Best Buy that's up near the Mire. And he had gone and parked behind the Best Buy and had started smoking pot sitting in his car when a cop car pulled up and he got arrested. And he was like, Mr. Brovier, I'm 16 years old. I'm a junior and I just got arrested and they're taking away my license. My parents won't talk to me right now. The kids at school are making fun of me. He's like, I don't, I don't know what to do. He's like, I, I can't recover from this. Like, he's like, I think I'm just gonna drop out. I'm like, Clayton, you cannot drop out of school from this. He's like, you don't understand this, bro, man. He's like, I got arrested in high school. That's it. I'm like, <laughs> turns out I got arrested in high school too. He was like, what? Now, I never thought I would tell anybody the story of me getting arrested in high school. I thought for sure that was a story that was going to die with me because it was one of the most horrifying moments of my life. And I never thought I would be telling it to a kid. But Clayton I cared about, and, and Clayton was, was hurting, and I wanted to do a thing to help him. So I told him the story. I was like, hey, I got arrested. And I told him this whole story that I'll be telling you guys today about me getting arrested in high school. And it helped him. Like, it wasn't changing your life helpful, but for him, it helped give guidance. And he was like, all right, so you can screw up your life and recover from it. And I was like, yeah. And he did. He actually went on and went to college and became like an insurance agent or something like that. Really boring, but he's a fun kid. But whatever. And so I thought that would be the end of it. Didn't think much about it, but it was the first time I'd ever told anyone this embarrassing story of my life. A year or so goes by, and I have another kid, Lindsay. Uh, and I taught multiple kids in Lindsay's family. She was like the third or fourth kid in the family. They had a really messed up home life. But she was really creative and very outgoing. And I love the kid. I have multiple things on my wall that connect back to Lindsay. And so she came back one day when she was also in high school and knocked on the door like, hey, Lindsay, I'm like, long time. She comes in like, can I talk? I'm like, yeah. And she shuts the door. I'm like, oh, crap, I was talking. And she comes in and walks over. She's like, hey, I did a thing. And I'm like, that's fine. Let's talk. 
So she had gotten arrested for shoplifting clothing while she was at the mall down in Casper, and her life was falling apart. And I'm like, hey, I've got a story for this. And so I shared my story, and Lindsay was the one that told me I should share this with students. Because at the end of me telling it to her, she goes, that was actually really helpful. And I was like, well, I'm glad I could help you. I was like, I hated it at the time. It brought you joy, or at least made things easier. That's a good thing. She goes, have you ever thought about telling that story to your students? I was like, <laughs> no, I want to keep my job. And she was like, no, I think it would be good if you told the story to kids. She's like, I think it, they could get help from it because I think kids need this kind of guidance and they need to hear something like this. And I was like, dear, I'm not telling. But she was persistent and I trusted her and she'd earned my trust. I was like, all right, I'll consider it. So as that year came to a close where I would normally show movies, I had one class period where I was like, I'm going to try it. one class period. And I was like, hey, instead of watching the movie today, you guys want to hear a story of like in my childhood where I screwed a thing up. They're like, yeah, that sounds kind of interesting. And I was like, okay. I broke into a sweat at the idea of telling this story to an entire classroom of kids. But I did. And they were enthralled and staring at me. And they're like, oh my God, do you have more? And I was like, so yeah, I've been arrested two other times. And so I ended up telling them, and then they told other kids, and they were like, we don't want to watch the movie. We want to hear your stories. I'm like, you guys want to hear me? Tell like, ah. And so that was sort of how it spread of me telling them all of these stories. So for me as a teacher now, here's my issue that I have now. The way I teach, I care about you guys. It's I get invested, and I enjoy teaching. I enjoy being in the room with you, and I enjoy interacting. But the drawback about caring about you is I don't want you guys to ruin your lives later on down the road. I don't want you guys to be the kid that has to show up and go, hey, Mr. Brogley, can we talk? And then shut the door. Don't get me wrong. If you do, I will absolutely talk to you and listen. I just don't want you to have to go down that path. So my goal is to try and help prevent you from going down that path. So there is a speech I'm going to give you next week, which is my way of trying to impact you. It is the most heartfelt thing I can present to you to try and help you not go down the path I did. In order to have that speech have weight and meaning, I am going to bear my soul to you. I am going to reveal to you the three most horrifying things I went through as a child that shaped me with the idea that if I bear my soul to you, then there is a chance you will be more receptive and listen to that story I give you on the last day. For some of you, it'll work. For others of you, not so much. But if it helps even one kid, then for me, it's worth it. And all of that begins when I was in second grade. So this is the first time I made a really poor choice and got myself in trouble with the police. This involves me and my younger brother, who's two years younger than me. So I was like eight years old and he was six years old. And it was in the summertime between, I think, first and second grade, or maybe second or third grade, right around here. It's been a hot moment for it. And we were hanging around with an older kid who turned out to be a bad influence on us. Now, when I say older kid, I mean, he was like in fourth grade. But being in second grade, that felt like an older kid. And he wasn't like going around like shaking kids and robbing stores. He was just rambunctious, probably didn't have the best home life, got himself in trouble. Parents didn't yell at him quite as much as they should have, caused issues like that. And so he and me and my younger brother were riding our bikes around our neighborhood. Oh, by the way, the pictures I'm getting ready to show you, they're from where this actually happened. I actually went back to my old hometown and took photographs of it. We had to go back there for a thing for my daughter's sports team. And so this is the actual house where it happened. I went back and found the house and took a picture of it. So we were biking around our neighborhood, and we found this house as we went by, which is like just down the street from us, and we happened to be able to see in the windows, and the windows were wide open, and as we biked by, we could see the fact there was nothing inside of it. And so the fourth there was like, hey, I think that house is empty. I was like, okay. And so we turned around in a little driveway, parked our bikes, got up and went up to the front door, and little windows that were there, and we looked in the front, and the whole place was empty. We were like, oh. That's kind of cool. We've never seen an empty house before. We'd only ever seen like normal houses that people lived in. And the fourth grader was like, hey, I think we should go in there and run around and make it like a little fort. 
I was like, that's a good idea. We should do that. So we went over to the front door, but of course, the people who own the place are not idiots and they locked the front door so we couldn't get in. But we were not ready to give up quite yet. Like, well, let's try the back door. Good idea. So we went around to the back of the house. I don't have pictures there because that would have been creepy if I went in the backyard. Use your imagination this part. But they had uh, the big, like, six foot wooden fence that went around the backyard. So we went around like, ah, oh, we can't get to the back door because of the wooden fence. But the fourth grader points out that next to the wooden fence in the side yard was one of those big metal electrical boxes that are like the neighborhoods. And we found that if we stood in the middle of the box, went all the way to the edge, ran as fast as we can, and then jumped like a squirrel, we could land on the fence and then scramble up over the top of it. So we did, like little squirrels, like, yeah, <laughs> came over the top, got into the backyard, found the back sliding door. But, uh -huh. This is how we get in. Backsliding door is locked also. But like, yeah, well, I guess we're thwarted. There's no way we're going to get in. So we went ahead and went back out. This time, instead of jumping over, we just unlocked the back fence and just walked out and around. And as we were coming around the house, on this side of it, down along the ground, they had this like silver half circle thing that was set into the ground. So like this. Now, some houses have a basement where like these but this one did not have a base, it has what's called a crawl space, where the house is not flat on the ground. There's like a little area that's like this big that you can literally crawl in to get like pipes and stuff like that. And so we're like, oh, well maybe we can get in that way, says the fourth grader. We're like, well, we're gonna have to open up the window. So the fourth grader got down this little hole and grabbed the window. He was like, yeah. and then just opened right up. We're like, oh, we're getting in. But then the fourth grader couldn't get in because he was like a happy boy. And so he tried to get in and he's like, I can't get in. So he pulls himself back down and he's like, oh, I can't get in. And so he looked at me. Me, being the good older brother, does what every older brother does. I offered my younger one. And I was like, obviously Nick's going to go in there. So I look at him like, Nick, can you get into that? To which he replied, curling into a ball and crying. Because that is how younger siblings fight things. He's like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, well, obviously that's not gonna work because the boy is sitting there crying. So that left the skinny twiggy child. <laughs> and so they both looked at me and they were like, How about you? And I'm like, Well, I don't want to go in there because there's spiders and it's dark and it's dirty, and I'm a prissy little boy, and I don't want to get dirty because that's scary. But then they did this thing called peer pressure. It's like, oh, I only get you every time. He was like, well, it'd be really cool if we could go in there. And I'm like, oh, he's like, why don't you just peek in there and see if you can find a way? Peek in there. And then I was like, like a little snake. I'm like, no, 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 no. I slithered over the top of it and I got through the little hole in my little twig body. I'm like, I, and I went through like up to my waist and it was dark. I can still picture it to this day, like halfway in there, my body in there, and it was just darkness everywhere except. Like along the outside edge where the house was, there's like a light where the house like connected. So I just had this little like glowing line that went around like the far side, and that was it. Darkness, dirtiness, spiders. And I'm like, no. I'm like, there's no way into the house. I'm like, I don't see anything. There's no point. And then out of nowhere, a beam of light just shoots down out of the middle of the dark. Oh no. From like this weird like hole in the ceiling above where I was, the floor of the house, the ceiling of me, beam of light comes down. I'm like, oh there's a light beam. He's like, you think you can get to it? And I went, yes. <laughs> because I could. It's just like for me, like where PJ was I'm like, I can get there. It's a beam of light. And I was like, okay. I'm like, all right, so I'm like, I can do it. So my like, army crawling across like little spider webs are going, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And I kept going all the way across to where it was. And I got to this beam of light and there's just a square. Now, the square is about like that big. It's a tiny little square that's like right there in the ceiling. And I crawl over to where it is and then all of a sudden, you have a gift for me. Like, I always wanted a piece of paper. What's going on? Maria. So beam of light coming through, and I'm like, oh, and I crawl over to where the little beam of light is, and I look up, I'm over now, I'm this way. I look up to where this little beam of light is, I see it, and I can see into that house. And I'm like, I yell back, going up through the hole. And they're like, okay. 
and they like take off running and like to go to the back of the house. I'm like, okay. So I stand up and I'm going through this little hole and it comes like this area is like machinery. There's like this big metal box, like a circular one. It's like making like a chugga, 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 chugga sound. Oh, being right. old now, I realized it was the furnace and the water heater and like the washer and dryer. Being a kid, I'm like, there's machinery. Then right, I popped up through it. As I stood up, there was this slatted door and that's where the light was coming through. Like apparently like, there was a window in the house and the sunlight and hit there and then gone through and hit this random like hole that was in the ground. And that was what I had saw. And so it was like God herself was like coming into the house. And then I shot a beam down there and I was like, yes. And I went into it. Why they had a hole in their house, I don't know. Because random animals could have gotten in or small children. And so that's why you want to always make sure your holes are covered. And I popped up through this little hole. I had to go between like the furnace and the water. And I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had to scoop in the two of them. And I got over to this door because it was closed. And I pushed my hand into it. It was like, snap. And it shut over to one side. And it opened up into a hallway. And I stepped in. And I was in the house. This is what I remember the layout of the house being. So this is where I was. I know we we're underneath the stairs. I stepped into this hallway and I could look over and the stairs went up behind me. There was a wall going this way, front door to the left. To the right was the kitchen area with the sliding glass door I'd seen before. And then you could run over here and there's like a dining room. There's like a front area room. And you can come over here to where the door for the garage was. Or sorry, for the front door of the house was. The garage was over there. Then we could like run around in circles. So I got out. Looked to my right, fourth grader and my younger brother were at the kitchen sliding door. Like their little faces were pressed up against it. I was like, woohoo! I'm like, ha 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 ha. And I go walking over to the back door and I'm like, oh, there's a house! And I was like, I was like, the back door and I slid it open. I was like, enter! And they did. And they came into the house and we ran around that place and it was epic. We jumped around like Everything our parents would let us do, we did in this house. Like jumping off of the top of the, like the counters, onto the ground, running around, jumping onto the walls, whatever we could think of. It was the best day in my entire life. Up until that point, it End of the day, we close everything back up. We go back out the back sliding door, close it behind us, get on our bikes, and we go home. Think nothing of it until the next day. Wake up. Trying to figure out what we want to do for the day. We're like, you know, it would be fun going back to the clubhouse we just made. And so this time we decided to pack backpacks and we made ourselves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we made snacks. We brought little Capri Suns and we brought toys with us, GI Joes and Hot Wheels. We had like an entire backpack with us because we knew what we were doing. And so we packed the backpack and off we went. Now, back in the 80s, I would just tell our parents, even at like eight years old, I'm like, I'm going for a bike ride. We're back at dusk. They're like, don't get killed. I'm like, okay. And off we would go. And we were just gone for the day. And it was the greatest. We went back over to this house. We did this for like four days straight that summer. Every day, we would show up, go there, park our bikes, go running around the house, spend the whole day playing. In the evening time, we would leave and come back home. Bomb. Till day four. Day four, I remember we're sitting in the house. We were in the kitchen and we were playing with Hot Wheels because we got in trouble at our house. We like rolled the Hot Wheels across the linoleum floor and like hit the furniture, like the wall. And we yelled at me here, be like, yeah, yeah, and like hit things like, ah, it's just the greatest. And so we're sitting there like winging them back and forth, and they're having a blast when we hear something at the front door. And you hear like that jingle, 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 jingle. At that front door, no. and all three was like stop and turn, and then you can see like a shaky thing at the front door. We have that. Like, do you, do you run out the back door? Do we run towards the front door? Do we go and hide? We lay down flat. Like, what what do we? And we're in the process of trying to figure out. We're all like looking at each other, trying to figure. And the front door opens. So we're like, well, running is the option. So all three of us get up and just run right here. So we didn't run far because we're not expert criminals. We just ran around the corner and then all three of us smack, smashed up against this wall. So I'm here, my younger brother went to this side, fourth grader here, me in the middle, right here is the edge and the kitchen is right there. And it goes like 10 feet or so down 
and then there's the room where the front door is. So we're smashing against the wall, and we hear the front door open. We hear it slam behind it. We hear boom, 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 and we hear something like going behind us, and we're like into the kitchen. We hear oh, and the first words, curse words, all of our curse words. And we're like ah, and all three of us like boom, something heavy gets set down. And we're like oh. All three of us have the same plan at the same moment. We sort of look at each other, we just go and scream, turn and run to our right, straight down around the corner and to the front door with the idea being that we're going to run out. Now, being an adult, if I was in a house that I thought was empty and I was into a kitchen and all of a sudden three goblins shriek mere feet from me. I would lay down, wet myself, and just call it a day. That's not what this guy did, but that's what I would do. So I remember we ran to the front door, and I got to it. And being the older brother, I bravely pushed my brother out of the way so that I could get to the door first, because that's what older siblings do. And so I got to the door first. I remember grabbing the door handle. And you know how in movies, when you see the girl running from the bad guy and she can't figure out the door, and you're like, what kind of idiot can't figure out a door? <laughs> so I was eight. I've been opening doors for like four or five years by now. I was like a door expert. But I remember my hand, and I remember like, it was like making like a clanky sound. I remember I was twisting it back and forth, and the fourth grader, my brother, like, were hitting, like, why aren't you open it? And I'm like, I'm trying to, like, get all the way to the Like, a whole, and I was like, and my mom was like, <laughs> twist and pull <laughs> both parts and i like twisted i was like ah and i opened the door as hard as i could and it hit the toes of my shoes and ricocheted shut but it took my brain a second to register because i went boom and like my hand was still here but there's no longer a door in it and the door was shut and my brain was like the door was open and now it's closed my brain was like why i'm like i don't know why and i was like i i i'm like oh, feet I was like, go back, twist it, step. This probably took all of six seconds, but it felt like an hour I was standing there. I'm like, how is this guy not caught us? But eventually, door, I'm pretty sure the guy back there was like, ah, ah, ah. we open the door, throw it open, all three of us go sprinting out the front door. Being the expert criminals we are, all three of us run to our houses. So fourth grader comes out the front door, goes that way towards his house. My brother and I come out the front door, go this way towards our house. Now, my younger brother, who was like kindergarten at this time, safety first, he comes running out. I remember he's like, ah, and then turned that way. And I'm like, and went down the driveway, passed over down the And I'm like, ah, staying on the sidewalk, smart kid. And so he's running down this way. And my younger brother was a bit more of a rounder child. Now he's taller and thinner and better looking than I am. But at the time, he was a rounder child. I was like, well, bone over. I was like running down the little thing. Me, being the tall, lanky, smart child, I'm like, yes. So I just came out and took off running along the grass as fast as I could. And I remember, like, as I was running, like, this is the fastest I've ever run. And I'm going, as like, mailbox, tree, mailbox. And I'm like, I'm so fast. I'm so excited. And remember, I look over to my right-hand side, my brother running along next to me, and I can make it, like, this brother eye contact thing going. And I'm like, we got to make it. He's looking at me and like nodding. And like as we're looking, I watch his head like turn behind me and his eyes get bigger. And I'm like, well, what are you looking? And I turn and I'm like, oh, and the man's right behind me. Like he came out right behind us. And of the three of us, he was like, golden child, bowling ball, twig child. And he was like, twig it is. And he went right after me. And so I'm running and I'm like, oh, and my brother's I look over and I see his eyes looking back. And all of a sudden, hand comes down on my shoulder, and I get that where all of like the whole momentum I feel like and I go forward, I come backwards, and I make eye contact with my brother, and he's looking at me, and I give him the don't stop running. He's like, I'm not stopping. <laughs> and he just keeps on going. And the guy like grabs me and turns me around. I remember to this day, I was convinced he was legally allowed to kill me. So I was preparing myself for death at this moment. So he turned me around. Also, why police were not called when three small children go running out of a man's house and he chases one of the children down and grabs the child? And back then it was like, 
oh, it's a doomsday. And then I just let it happen. But he grabs me, turns me around. He was like, who are you? To which I responded, and just screaming in his face. He was like, why are you in my house? Like, and so he was like, fine. And he just picks me up and carries me back into his own house with my little feet kicking. Oh, I know. I did, right? My friend, I'm like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Uh, I tried to like defensively butt myself, but it wouldn't work. Um, and so he picks me up, brings me back into his house, and sets me down on the stairs. Now, I didn't find the right picture. Oh, no. This one has like a wall right there. His stairs have like little bars that like would open up so you like seal them and you can like jump through it. Remember, he set me down on the stairs. I immediately reached over and grabbed the bars, like wrapped my arms and legs around it. And I'm like, if you're killing me, I'm taking your stairs with me. He sat there and he was like, fine, if you don't talk to me, maybe you'll talk to the police. And I was like, are they going to kill me? And he was like, what is wrong with you? And he left me there and he went and called the police. And I'm like, who's the police? He's like, I have an intruder in my house. Yes, I have him right now. Yes, please send the police. And so I'm sitting there just like mm-hmm. rocking back and forth, holding on to little bars. Time goes by. And then so there's a doorbell ring. Bing bong. Guy goes over there, walks right past me because he's like in the kitchen, probably kicking my toys in the wall or something like that. Walks by where I am. Opens the front door and the door opens so I can't see. You know, it opens this way so I can't see the police officer. And I'm like, yes, sir. Are you a police officer? He's like, yes, sir. He's like, I have the intruder right now. Like, do you have the intruder in your house? Like, yes, I have the intruder right here on the stairs. They go, he's on the stairs. He goes, yes. They go, can we see him? He goes, yes. And he steps back and the two police officers step in. And I have my little arms <laughs> wrapped around the pole and I'm staring up. I can remember I made eye contact. I they step in with rap. And they looked at each other, they looked at me, and they went, the small child? <laughs> and he was like, yes, the small child. And they looked at me like, son, is this your house? And they go, oh, no. They're like, do you live here? No. They're like, do you want to come with us? I responded with, are you going to kill me now? And I was like, no, son, we're not going to kill you now. To which I followed with, Who's going to kill me? I needed to know this. It seemed really important. They go, no one's going to kill you. And I was like, I don't know if I trust you, but okay. And so the police officers took me out. There were no handcuffs because, again, you'd be like putting handcuffs on pipe cleaners. It would just fall right off. But they went ahead and like took me out to the car, and they set me in the back seat, and they drove me home. So in my memory... I remember going like in the from here and in the car ride back to my house, being like this long drive where I was like freaking out and no idea how I was going to treat things, but like finally getting home. When I went back to go take pictures, house, neighbor house, my house, <laughs> literally like two houses apart. I think like the police officer was like, "Where's your house?" I was like, "In the blue house." They're like, "Where?" I think it's like pulled back in the things in. Mm. So this was my house. And so I remember they pulled up into the driveway and they got me out and they walked me up the front door. I was in the front, police officer on either side of me, hands on my shoulders, and went up and rang the doorbell. So I ding dong. And my mom opened it. She's like, Hi, what's going on? I'm like, ma'am, is this your son? She's like, Yes, that's my son. I'm like, well, ma'am, we just caught him breaking in or into your neighbor's house. Goes, what? Uh, yes, ma'am. Him and two accomplices were breaking into your neighbor's house, and so we're trying to track down the two accomplices. I'm like, son, who are your accomplices? I'm like, oh, I don't know what that word means. It's like, who was helping you? Like, being the good criminal I was, immediately ratted them out. I'm like, fourth grader is in front of the house, like, and my brother, I don't know what it is. And so they had to go and find the fourth grader, and they brought him and his parents back to our place, and they had to go find my brother. Now, my brother, being in kindergarten, when the monsters come for you, do what every smart kindergartner does. Close, hundred to the bed. And so he had gone to, they couldn't find him in the house. They're like, he's here somewhere. Eventually, like, he was under the bed, like curled into a little ball. And my dad had to like grab his ankles and Dre's like, ah! they dragged him back out and took him downstairs. They set all of us in the, our family room having these really ugly brown couches. We were like sitting there and the police officers come in like, all right. So it's us three, his parents, my parents. They go, son, their children, do you know what you did was wrong? Like, yes, we know what we did was wrong. He's like, do you understand that we could have arrested you and put you in jail? You could be in jail right now. Do you understand that? Like, we understand. But I had no idea. 
And so the police officer is going through and explaining to us all these horrible things we did, how we are going to end up going to jail, how we have to keep ourselves clean. And it was horrifying. And my parents were so angry. And that message stayed with me and freaked me out. And it prevented me from getting arrested again for six years. So I made it from that all the way into my freshman year of high school before I made another poor choice. The good news is, I mean, there is no major fallout from the first time I got in trouble. It was officially just getting picked up by the police, but it definitely made an impression on me. This one, there's no sugarcoating it. I was a bad kid. I did bad, dumb things. Starts in my eighth grade year. Uh, towards the end of eighth grade, I wanted to be popular more than anything. And so part of that was trying to find ways to be popular. And there were these kids in my school who started shopping. And I saw them shoplifting. And I thought, those kids are idiots. And I could definitely do it better than them. So I decided that I would start shoplifting. Because if they could get away with it and they were idiots, then someone as smart as me could definitely get away with it. And the answer is, yeah, I did. And I was good at it. And that is awful. And it started at the end of my eighth grade year. And I started shoplifting. And I did it all through the summer between eighth grade and high school. And I did it all through the beginning of my freshman year of high school. But I told myself I was not like those other kids. Because those kids were bad criminals. Because they were stealing like CDs from stores or CD players and reselling them. And I wasn't doing anything like that. What I was stealing was candy and comic books. And so I convinced myself that made me a better person. It didn't. It made me a dorkier criminal. But I convinced myself that it made me a better person. So this, and that got to the point where I would end up shoplifting in front of police officers because I liked the challenge and I thought I was good at it. And I was, and I did get away with it. And things went wonderfully. Until late October of my freshman year. Late October of my freshman year, I was at school and I was on the wrestling team. Uh, I started wrestling in eighth grade, loved the wrestling team, and I kept wrestling all the way into high school. And one day, uh, I saw a kid in, in the hallway at school and he was using breath spray. Uh, this stuff that you use, like, sh -sh -sh and spray into your breath. You got a bigger picture over there. Binaka breath spray. And he was in the hallway and he was talking to these girls and he was like, shh, shh. And he talked to the ladies like, oh, how are you doing? And I was like, wait a minute. That dude's getting all the ladies. Obviously, it's because he has breath spray. So if I had breath spray, I'd be getting all the ladies. Not paying attention to the fact that it was he was really good looking and popular. I thought it was just the breath spray. And I was like, all I need is if I get breath spray, then the ladies will dig me. So I decided to get myself some breath spray. So, well, it's expensive, like three dollars. You have to pay that for wrestling. You can get it for free. Oh no! So anyway, so that day we had a wrestling meet, and unlike in junior high here, when you have like a wrestling meet or a game, you have to go to your coach's room after school. In high school, that's not what they did. They were just like, "Hey, bus leaves at four. Don't get in trouble. Be back here by four. And then you would just like go wander places. And I went to school in Noblesville, and Noblesville, where the high school is, there's a literally a shopping complex like a, a strip mall right next to it, like a um, McDonald's, stuff like that, and a CVS. So that's where we would go after school. And I remember I was like, me and like 10, 11 friends, we had all these wrestlers. We went to this McDonald's, caused a bunch of havoc because we were idiots. And then we went to this CVS that was there. And the kids I was hanging out with, they were also shoplifting. We were just a bunch of hooligan bad children all on the wrestling team. It was not, not to make it better, it was, just, it was not just me. I was hanging around with other kids making poor choices. So we all go into this CVS. The way the doorway is set up, because this can play into the story here in a moment, is they did not have the sliding door, because this was back during the dinosaur days. You had to push them with your own arms. But when you came in, instead of being like this double door thing, they had like a wall in the middle. You would come in, and then you had to turn to go that way out. And then like this was just a plain glass wall, and then there was a checkout counter here, and there was a door here. You had to enter the glass door, turn, and go out the door that way. Remember, I came in, and I was like, all right. I never bought breath spray there. I had no idea where it was. So I start, start wandering around the store trying to figure out where it was. I was going like up and down all these different aisles until I eventually found the breath spray. But I'd never stolen this before. I had a method for stealing candy. 
kind of messy for some of the books. I didn't really know how to go about stealing like this. But I was like, how hard can it be? So I grabbed it and I ended up walking to like a back aisle. I have to walk along where it has like a wall on one side and it has like the aisle on the side next to me. So I just walk along and I'm like, perfect. No one can see. So taking the container, walking along, and I just am like walking all cool, rip it open, take out the press spray, put it in my pocket, crumple up the package, shove it onto a random shelf, keep walking, turn the corner. Easy peasy. No one's going to catch me. Everything's good. Walking to the store, talk to a couple of my friends, spend a few more minutes like going around talking to people and stuff like that. And then I go to exit and leave. Go past like a little checkout area that's over here. Say hi to two friends who are checking out at the same time. Go to the first double door, turn, go to the second double door, opening the double door, stepping outside. Door open, handle in hand, big open bright sky in front of me as I get ready to go out the door. Hand comes down the chair. Well, hand on shoulder, deep voice behind me goes, were you planning on paying for that, son? If you've never had a moment where you have that second where you get in trouble and you feel your stomach drop, and that was the sensation I had of a thing where you know you've done a bad thing and you're just hoping you don't get caught doing a bad thing, and that moment you get caught, and it's like being on a roller coaster, it's like, boom, that was the sensation. I just had this boom, and like my whole stomach fell. I was like, oh. And so hand on door, and I'm like, oh. I'm like, this is happening right now. Here's the thoughts that went through my head that I can still picture to this day. Hand on door. His hand on my shoulder. My thought is, I'm a wrestler. I know how to grab it. I know how to get away from people who are trying to grab you. And whoever this person is behind me, I'm younger than them, and I'm faster than them. So there is no way that they can catch me if I want to go. So I start planning how to get away from him and out the door and around the corner before he can stop me. And another part of my head goes, you know, there's 11 other kids in that store. What are the chances one of them are going to rat you out? If it was two of your best friends, yeah, you can get away with it. But all it takes is one of them to say your name, and they're going to come look for you at the school. And I was like, oh. and I went through like the kids there, and I'm like, yeah, I can't trust him. I can't trust him. I can't. And I had to make the toughest choice I've ever made in my life up to that point. And I remember holding on to the door, hand on my shoulder, him starting to pull me around, and going, now or never, now or never, now. And I let go of the door. And I remember watching it slide away from me going, did I just make a mistake? And turned me around. And the guy I was facing was the pharmacist <laughs> wearing the white coat. And I'm like, eh? and that moment is like shocked. And he had in his hand my smashed up container, the packaging that I put onto the shelf. <clears throat> and he's holding it in his hand. He goes, were you planning on paying for this or just leaving? To which I replied, what? Because that seemed like the right response to play dumb. He goes, son, one, we have cameras. Two, it's in your pocket. And I went, oh, yeah. And I reached in and grabbed it. I go, here you go. And I handed it to him and turned to leave. Apparently, that's not the way it goes. Because he goes, thanks. And then turned me back around and marched me back to the store. So he then takes me back through the whole store and he walks me past around, hand on shoulder, smashed up container, everything in his hand, walks me past my friends who are checking out. And both of them, like, they were in the process of checking out. They're both like turning and staring at me, I'm not making eye contact. I had to go past the candy aisle where all my wrestling friends were. And I'm like turning, like, them all like, kind of like, like staring at me, like, not making eye contact. And he walks me into this, the back room, like, doors open, like, little swinging door, doors open. Takes me into this back room, puts down this little the, the packaging of Banaka, puts down this little table, and grabs this chair, like my plastic ones, except it had, you know, I remember this to say, the instead of like the rail feet, it had like the four legs, because he drug it across the ground. He did that whole <laughs> he slings like Stop! I was like, oh. <laughs> and I sat down in this little chair, and it was this. The back area, so you have the whole back, uh, like storage room, 
It was like the hard cement floor, big like lights above us, and it's big empty room. And he sits me down, and then he's I thought when Max sits me, there's like a telephone on the wall, and he picks up the telephone and he calls the police with me sitting there. He's like, Yes, I caught a shot. Like, yeah, he's right here with me. Yep, he's sitting in the back room. And life sent. I sat there and I watched him call the police, and I realized this is happening. This is real. I getting arrested for shoplifting, and and there's no one for me to blame. Like I did this. This was my own doing, and I'm a freaking idiot. And then he finished the call, and he looked at me. And he goes, "Son, stay there." And then he left. I'm like, "What?" I'm like I guess he had to go back to work. But it's just me in this wide open room, trying to figure out what to do. And I'm looking around and going. And to my right, about five feet away, is the exit door, just sitting there with a little thing that says, alarm will sound. But I'm the only one sitting in this room. I'm like, do you run? Like, if I wait long enough, my friends will be gone. And if my friends are gone, what's stopping me from running out that door and just disappearing? Because then how do they track me back? The only thing that prevented me from running him saying the fact they had me on camera and i realized if i'm on camera then they can just take that videotape to the school and it's not like you wonder what school you could literally open the back door and see the school through the back door so you know what school i came from if they showed that video cassette to my school the chances of me being recognized were really high and i'm sitting there in this chair weighing it going is it worth running what are the chances they're going to actually recognize me can I get away from this whole thing? Now, I would love to tell you that I was a good person and I was like, no, I'm going to take it like a man. But no, I was on the verge of crying and I wanted to save my life and I legit considered running away. And I may have, except the door opened and the cop came in. And at that point, I was like, well, I'm not running now. And so, door swing open, guy comes back in, big, big cop comes walking in. <laughs> Remember, he steps in, he's like, what was he accused of stealing? And the pharmacist like points down and the guy picks up like the binoculars and he's like, breast spray. Looks at me and he's like, my God, you're an idiot. And he was like, that sucks. And like, he just threw it back down. He's like, stand up. I'm like, okay. He turned me around and put handcuffs on me. Like legit handcuffs behind my back, handcuffs on me. If you've never worn handcuffs, go you. That's a good thing. Handcuffs hurt. Um, if you know, there's these little bones that are right here that hurt because bones don't move. Handcuffs are made of metal. And when a police officer wants to be mean to you, he can snap it on those bones and it hurts like nothing else. And so you can go here and that's squishy, not nearly as bad. Here, not squishy. And so he snapped handcuffs onto both my wrists and gave like a little cheek and push me like, that's not. And I made like a little screaming sound. And we're going, did that hurt? I went, uh huh. He's went, Good. And I was like, oh, uh, and then led me through it. Oh, and yeah, they're bad. Hold on to class, I have to wait. So puts handcuffs on me and then does the whole picky uppy thing with the, with the right arms, my hands are to one side, and then leads me back through the store. I remember as I came through the store, we made those little doors, and there was like this big back hallway that where all the, like, the customers were. And I looked over to my left as he first came out. And it seems like a little thing, but I still remember it to this day looking to my left, and there was a mom there, a young lady with like her four or five-year-old daughter. And we first came through, and she looked up, and she saw us. There's like a smile on her face. And then she saw the police officer, and then she saw me. And I watched the smile drop from her face, and then she grabbed her daughter and moved her daughter behind me. Which implies that I was such a bad person that her child needed to protect me. And it's one of those moments where when you're 14 and you realize that some person is so scared of you that they have to protect their children from you, 
it's a gut punch. And that's how it was like, oh, this is who I am now. Like I'm the kind of person that parents have to hide their children from. That sucked. And then led me through the whole store, went out those front double doors again. All the way out to the front double doors. I remember we could see down the whole right side of the building to the very edge. And as we went out, his cop car, lights were going, not sirens, but the lights were going. And it was like right out the front door. As I got let out to the front seat, I didn't sit in the back, I sat in the front. We could look down the building and there were three heads peering around like the side of the building, like a little totem pole. Uh, and it was my three friends from wrestling, like my three closest freshman friends who were watching me get arrested. Uh, because that's what friends do. Friends watch you get arrested so they can make fun of you for years, or at least that's what my friends told me. Uh, and so I remember the police officer like seeing me looking over there and all three heads were doo -doo -doo, and like disappeared. And then he just was like, <laughs> Ah, criminal has a fan club. And I was like, oh. And it's like that whole just being called criminal. And he sat me down in the front seat. And remember, there was a shotgun bolted into the dash. So I sat down. I had to like move my head around. It was like giant shotgun. I was like, mm -hmm. and I couldn't sit down easily because I was still in the handcuffs. I sat down and he had to put the seatbelt on me. So I'm sitting in the front seat. He leans in, snaps in the seatbelt, stands back up. And I remember, again, the little things. Put on seatbelt, and he's standing there for a second. And I finally like look up at him, and he's just glaring at me. He goes, "You know what? It's a short drive. Try not to steal again." Anymore. And then just shut the door. And it was again just a gut punch. Of, oh yeah, I'm a piece of trash. Thank you for reminding me. And it just hurt. So then we drive to the police station. Um, it's a sh in Noblesville, small town. It was a short drive. Got to police station. Uh, I don't remember. Walking in, I don't remember them taking off handcuffs. I know they had to at some point. Uh, I remember being in his office. Uh, it was a tiny, if you were like my desk area, if you can imagine that having walls around it, like that's how big his office was. It was tiny. And so he was at, behind his desk. I was sitting at like, this little chair and he was doing a typing thing. And he called my mom. Remember that phone call? And he called my mom. He was like, yes, ma'am. He was like, yes, we arrested your son for shoplifting. Yes, ma'am, your son. Yes, ma'am, it was shoplifting. Yes, ma'am, we have the right person. Uh, he was like, you need to come pick him up. And he's been like, oh, God, oh, God. And then hang up. He's like, your mom will be here in a little bit. So I just sat there in this chair, and he kept doing a typing thing. And so I was like, all right, the rest of the time. And I was trying not to cry. As hard as I could, I did not want to cry. So I'm looking around the room, trying to find things to distract myself, to prevent me from crying. And there was a wall uh, to my left which had a bunch of wanted posters on it. Like you see like in movies, like legit wanted posters. And they were like all these people who've been like escaped from things. They were really cool posters, like like their crime and their face and like the dates like that. And I was sometimes I was like standing like reading all the different things on there. And I found it fascinating. And the cop was awake across from me. And I see him like stop what he's doing and then look at me, look at the wall, look back at me and he goes, huh, what, your family up there? It was like, oh, like it was just that gut punch. I'm like, no, I don't. He was like, no, well, someday. And then just went back to typing. And I was just like, son of a bitch. I was like, so I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna look straight down the rest of the time. So I just stared at the ground. I'm like, you can't keep attacking me. I'm like, you can't be that mean. I remember the next thing after staring at the ground is my mom coming in. Uh, door opens behind me and I turn around and my mom steps in. I had a good relationship with my parents. I got along with my mom, I got along with my dad. Uh, they were great parents, very loving, good communication, had no major issues with them. Mom comes in, opens the door, me sitting in chair and there's no yelling. She just walks in, steps up next to me and looks down. She just goes, is it true? Did you do this thing? I'm like, yeah, yes, I did. She's like, she doesn't listen. And then just turned around and walked out. I'm like, do I go with you? I'm like, mm -hmm. and I was like, God, I'm like, ah, ah. and it's like, ran out after my mom. And she just does like, doesn't stop, doesn't talk to me, just walks out and goes like a little checkout, like a little checkout area, like talk to the police. They gave me back my coat I've been wearing, so they take my coat from me. I made back the coat and we're walking out to the car. And my mom's car was this gray Pontiac Pontiac. And it was late October, so it was cold outside. And I remember I sat in the front passenger seat and I had my feet up on the, the dashboard and I wrapped my arms around my legs 
and I put my head against the window, and I could feel the cold window against my head as we drove home. It was like a 15-minute drive home, and we're like watching the trees go by, and my mom didn't yell at me the whole time. She just talked, and it was that depressing, disappointed speech. It was just, did we not give you enough money? I'm like, no, we're getting allowed. She was like, did I do a bad job raising you? I'm like, no, you guys are fine. She's like, do you not love us? I'm like, oh God, no. And so it was like just that kind of stuff. I'm like, no. And it's like, there was no yelling. It was just this disappointment. It was just awful. So we get home and uh, my brother was already home because he was younger. And so I came in, I remember I just walked right past him. He's like, hey, don't go. And I just went right past him. Went straight upstairs, went to my room and then laid down on my bed. And I was like, we'll talk when your dad gets home. I remember laying on my bed, staring at my ceiling, trying to figure out how badly I had screwed up my life. I'm 14 years old, I am arrested. I got handcuffs put on me, went to the police station. How do you recover from this as a person? Because I know everyone at school is going to know this happened to me. My friends at school are going to say, my teachers, how do you face your teacher after doing something like this? knowing your teacher knows what you did. And I was like, forget teachers. How am I supposed to ask a girl out on a date? I'm like, I'm going to be trying to go out with girls who had dances coming. I'm like, no girls don't want to come out with me. The fact that I'm the criminal that got arrested. I'm like, why even bother continuing going forward? My life is over. That's where I was mentally. So my daddy gets home and I can hear my dad and my mom talking downstairs. And then I can hear them coming up the stairs. I got the bed. I was like, all right. Let's see what happens. And so they both come in and they sit down in chairs and they go, all right, are you ready? They go, well, first off, you're grounded. Why do I think this stuff is that? All right. And then we've talked and we've come up with the worst possible punishment. They go, you're going to school. Yeah. They go, and the day after that, and the day after that. You don't get to miss school. You are going to be going to school from here going forward. I was like, that, that's my punishment? I'm like, I've already been going to school. I'm like, I thought I was getting let off easy. I'm like, your punishment is making me go do a thing I've already been doing. But my parents were smart. Because that's what they thought. They go, oh, honey, you don't understand. Your life changes as of this moment. The worst thing we can possibly do is make you go to school. You now have to go face kids at your school knowing this. That is the worst possible thing that's going to happen to you. Right now, you don't need us yelling at you. You need our love because your, thought, your life is going to get a whole lot harder moving forward. I thought they were just making stuff up. They were not. The worst, cruelest people in the world are kids your own age. They are relentless and awful and evil. And this was before we had social media, before we had cell phones, but not before we had rumors and before we had kids telling stories. So the next day, I had to go to school. And I remember just on the bus, going and sitting in my seat on the bus, kids were already turning to stare at me. And I, as I walked to my seat, the kids would like sit there and turn and look at me. On the bus ride, I had the kids who would go for you know, like their heads like pop up and they turn around and look at me and like sit back down and you hear giggling. And I was like, oh. I got to school and somebody had gone out and bought a whole bunch of banaka and taped it all over my locker. So when I got to school, there was all of these things taped up onto it. Kids would randomly throw banaka and breath mints at me in the hallways at school. I was called criminal. I was called thief random upperclassmen who are two, three years older than me would randomly come by and shoulder slam me and then just yell awful things. Having to go to school and put up with other kids was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. But what's weird is the thing I remember most, and it wasn't even a kid trying to be mean to me. It was this girl in my English class. I had just gotten put in advanced English. I was regular English all through like my entire life and all through you know, my, my middle school, junior year. And I finally got put into advanced English my freshman year. So I'd been in advanced English for all of two months and I did not feel like I belonged. I thought I was in a class with a whole bunch of smart kids and I was the one dummy. I already felt like an outcast. 
but there was a couple of kids in there that were super nice to me. And one of them was this girl who was just nice. She was just a good person. And I was walking down the aisle to get to my seat. And I had to walk past her desk. And I remember she had like, like her pencil pouch stuff on her desk. And I was walking by her. And she was smiling and talking to her friend. And she looked up and the smile dropped off her face. And she grabbed the stuff on her desk and slid it to the other side of her desk. And then just sort of turned and kept talking to her friend as I went by. And it seems like a small thing. And so you realize, again, it implies I am so untrustworthy that she couldn't even have stuff near me. And it was that moment that, like, it almost broke. I could put up with other kids being mean, but it was this one nice girl who did this small thing that almost made me break down crying at school. I had to eventually go to court. If you've ever been in Noble's Hill, there's this big building that's in the middle. That's their courthouse. I had to go in front of a judge in that courthouse. And there is a room where I had to go in front of the judge with my mom to take a day off of work. And I had to dress up in a suit and go stand in front of him <clears throat> and plead my case. I remember standing there and him like going through my thing. is like, all right, David Brovia, I can read there. He was like, well, you've had really good grades at school and you've never been in trouble with the law before. I was like, I haven't. Uh, because apparently that eight-year-old thing well, it wasn't actually on my record. So we were all good there. And so I was like, yeah, never been in trouble with the law. I was like, and I have good grades. He goes, all right, so here's what we're going to do for you. He's like, do you know what probation is? And I'm like, I've heard of probation. He's like, I think I could check as a police officer. He's like, uh huh. We're going to give you what's called deferred probation. You know what that is? I go, not the slightest idea. He goes, here's how deferred probation works. If you're a good kid, nothing bad happens to you. What you're going to do is you're going to walk out of this building today. And you don't have to worry about anything as long as you don't get in trouble by your 18th birthday. On your 18th birthday, your record gets expunged. It means it gets wiped out like it never happened. You go back to start to zero. Everything is good. All you have to do is not get in trouble. And I was like, oh, dude, that's super easy. I can do that. And then the judge leaned forward. He goes, son, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Deferred probation means if you get picked up for anything, if your name ever gets called through the police for anything, you go to jail, straight to jail. If you're out after 11 o'clock with friends and you guys are just going home from a chess club meeting and you guys get pulled over and your name gets rung through the system, you're going to jail and your friends go free. If you're ever at a party and any kid there has alcohol, they all get to go home free, you go to jail. Anything that happens and your name comes up there, I am putting in the police record, you go to jail. And as soon as that happens, you're going to come back into this courtroom, and then I'm going to throw the book at you because I'm letting you go free today. Do you understand me? I'm like, oh, God, yes, sir. Never do anything bad. Never do anything bad. I'm with you completely. And so the idea was make it till I turn 18 and everything disappears when I'm good. If I get in trouble for the slightest thing, I get in trouble for the new thing and for this old thing, which seems like it should be easy. This was the very beginning of my freshman year. I didn't turn 18 until the end of my senior year, which means I had to go through the entire year, four years of high school, without ever getting in trouble for anything, which leads to my next story, which is next week. And now we get to wrap up with our final thing. So this weekend, don't get arrested. I'm going to 